RSP Creative Studios, writing about Ruth Cox, photorealism. Take one. Hi, this is Dr. Robin Scott Peters, and this is Arting About, and we are here today in Locke, California, and we're meeting with fine artist Ruth Cox, and I have thrown the title of photorealism on this, this particular uh, adventure today. And I would like you all in TV Land to meet Ruth Cox. Ruth, say hello to all our friends in TV Land. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I always like saying that. Um, Ruth, we met through a series of circumstances uh, um, of, of a person that we, we know, and I have stumbled upon some amazing art. So we're here today to sort of dig in a little deeper how you create what you create, and and if you could talk a little bit about um, sort of your your initial experiences with art. I mean, what what is what are those foundations that have led you here you know, initially? What sparked your interest? Uh, well, I come from a a line of uh, artists. Um, I'm probably roughly fourth generation of painters and artists and artisans. Um, and I've been literally drawing and painting since the age of four that I can remember. And my mother was an artist, and I remember spending countless hours with her in the studio that, that she had in the Bay Area. Mm. And as long as I can remember, uh, I was going to be an artist, an accomplished professional artist, a painter. And so through thick and thin, I've continued to pursue it my entire life. Mm. How do you how do you how do you define that? And when you say a, a professional artist, I mean what what was that sort of? Um, the the term professional is, I believe, for me, it means someone who takes their craft or or their art seriously and is dedicated and committed to the work and uh, exploring you know different mediums until you find ones that feel uh, comfortable or have a, a flow for, for you, or in my case for me, which right now it happens to be oils. Mm -hmm. um, and also professionalism means I spend anywhere from 40 to 80 hours in studio time a week, and that's the commitment. Am I talented? I am talented. I, like I said, I, I, it, it's in my, my family history, but the truth and the reality is, is I'm dedicated, and so I work continually in my studio and, you know, take myself and my work seriously. And, um, and then, of course, there's, there's marketing is also a part of that, too. That's part of being professional. And, right. and uh, I'm, not, I'm not one of those whimsical, quote-unquote, romantic type of artist, although I have that in my work and what I do, but I, I don't just term myself an artist for the sake of it sounds good mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so is there uh, one of those things I, I when I was teaching uh, at the university one of the things that I always bang upon is the fact that uh, there, there always seems to be an economic component to our artists that we're training that we leave out of the mix or, the, or that business right. component so can, right. you, can you address that a little bit in terms of well, it's very are. tricky. <laughs> the economical component is very tricky, and of course that has to do with marketing, and it has to do with the commitment to your work and getting it out there. Um, and the truth is, for most, for most of us artists, um, the economics of what we do is a struggle. It's not, uh, unless, unless you're in a situation where you, know, you have someone who can literally bankroll your craft or your talent. Now, it doesn't necessarily happen for most of us. Right. I've had to, I mean, there's been, through my lifetime, I've had to work numerous jobs 
for other other people. Oftentimes, I may work as an independent contractor. I'm I'm usually committed to you know the fields, the different fields of art, uh, designing fabrics and producing fabrics, wall coverings. Mm. I've done that. Interior design, anything that you know is creative, not necessarily painting, but through it all for me, it was always about gaining a commission as a painter. And you know that's come in, in, in numerous different ways. It could be actually painting on a canvas, right. like any one of these, or it could be gaining a commission for, you know, trompe l'oeil on somebody's ceilings or walls, or, um, you know. So there are different ways for me that I have literally learned to dovetail what it is that I do. And it's only been in the last two years that I've been able to finally commit you know, solely to my studio and my artwork, mm -hmm. but it's taken a long, a long time to get here. So we're in, in, in I always find it kind of fascinating. Uh, I've been to Costa Mesa, Venice Beach, I've been, you know, Santa Monica. Uh, artists always seem to find the most interesting places to live, and you certainly have found a place to live here that's interesting. So yes. can you tell us a little bit about lock and what's happening here and why why you found yourself here okay um well lock is a very unique uh, community we're located nestled right on the sacramento river and uh, i from the time i was about nine or ten i actually beca started becoming familiar with the delta lock being part of it um, and when i was in my late 20s, an opportunity opened up for me to come and live here to rent a space. And uh, that was about 27 years ago, and I did And uh, at that time. And I was uh, continuing, I was pursuing art at that point, but I was also studying full-time at University of the Pacific. So the commute wasn't that, you mm. know, that Ugly. big of a, no, right, it wasn't right. that big of a deal. Mm. And I was a full-time single mother at the time for little kids, mm. <laughs> single mom, single parent. Mm. So I had a lot going on and, and a lot of struggles, um, you know, financially. I went through UOP pretty much on scholarships and uh, worked really hard, took a lot of workshops, spent a lot of time on campus. Um, and so, and you know, this was a perfect place for an artist at that time, even though it was predominantly Chinese mm. then. Um, but it was a good, safe community for, for a single mother with very little children whose focus was art and um, school at the time. Quiet, it was peaceful. We have community gardens. We have uh, the Sacramento River. We also have quiet sloughs in the back where you can just take walks and it's very peaceful. And a chainsaw right now. Or a chainsaw <laughs> in the background right now. They're, they're cutting the one of the older trees down, yeah. We are, we, we, we are aware of the chainsaw <laughs> in the back, so we might as well just make a note of that to you, dear fans. <laughs> right. So please bear with us. Of it. all the days, this, today was the day the tree's coming down. <laughs> Can't ask the guy to stop working. Yeah. So, you know, it is uh, seven to five. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so, uh, so I left Locke after doing, uh, spending a, a couple years here some years ago I left Locke and moved to the Bay Area and uh, was in the Bay Area where you know thriving working running my own business company producing fabrics wall coverings mm -hmm. to uh, working as an independent contractor for interior design mm -hmm. staging um, you know I've done a numerous amount of jobs mm -hmm. involving the arts and um, my youngest daughter graduated from high school five years ago, this past June. And at that point, I was pretty much preparing her for when she graduated in the city that I, I was going to be leaving the city. And literally two weeks after she graduated, I left the city and left her there. And she, you know, she was pretty much set to start college. And for the first time after raising five children, I was on my own, and so for about a year and a half, two years, there's Mark. <laughs> so, I'm always busy the here in Locke. <laughs> Perfect <Love> timing. <laughs> um, I traveled for, for a few years, and I did, um, I did, again, did independent contracting. I would in, do independent contracts for about six months, and then the second half of the year, 
I would work out of a studio and I just happened to be doing a project in Stockton and I thought gosh I haven't been to Locke I haven't been back to Locke in probably 20 years since I left here and I thought I wonder I wonder what it looks like and so and that was about five years ago now and I, I came through here and ironically some of the people who were here when I was here before who were, were also were artists had returned two years, mm. three years prior to my coming to check out what was what was new in Locke. A little energy circle <laughs> going on here. Right? Yeah, uh -huh. and, it was, it's a, and it was very fascinating what I discovered. There were uh, professional writers and photographers who were kind of like me. We were all starting out all those years ago. And they had come back after achieving a lot of success in their careers, mm. being published, you know, um, musicians who had at that point been writing for you know symphonies one one gentleman who actually had written music for the New York Symphony comes through here so it so the dynamic and the dynamic of course have sh had shifted a lot of the Chinese the original Chinese uh, people that had lived here had passed on and their families had moved on so the community is no longer predominantly Chinese it's it, we're very eclectic very small, total of 68 people that live here. Very quiet, but most of them, most of the people that live here are artistic. We all still pursue our art and our craft. And we all do it, we're very, each one of us are very dedicated to what we do. And Locke is an environment that really supports that. And each one of us, I feel, because of our connections, our conversations, we socialize in the back garden, we get together, we talk, we support one another, you know, emotionally, pretty much uh, our, our crafts anyway. Mm. And it's always pretty, pretty positive. And um, originally when I came back, I thought I would just have a studio for six months and here I am, you know, going on five years now mm. 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 that I've been out here. It's a beautiful community. Uh, I'm gonna take a little tour later and do some B-roll so we can cut it in. Uh, great uh, um, art galleries here, uh, ironworks here, some really interesting yes. places. So if you are in the area, the Delta, Sacramento, Galt, Lodi, that little area there, you could swing up here very quickly. It's a beautiful drive out to along the Delta uh, and uh, really explore some great, great art. Right, you know, some great art. I'm really excited that the, there's communities, these little enclaves here. Uh, Woods Hole, where I grew up, uh, they have sort of an interesting little mixer, not 68 peoples, but, uh, <laughs> but, the, but they're not large either. Right. You know, it's a little water right. community, and, and it's an artist colony in a lot of ways. It's a scientific community, so it draws. Uh, I, I find it a lot of artists are... Uh, Scientists. If you look through history, you'll see that a lot of writers were scientists, doctors. That, that left brain, right brain sort of thing uh, overlaps, and they they have to do both. Right. Um, and that's a good segue, I think, into what we're doing here. What you're doing. I'm not doing anything other than right. admiring and enjoying and and adoring. Right. Uh, but somehow this this woman has a, a, a talent that is incredible um, to be able to use oil it, first off because of the way the medium works it, it, it's, it's lengthy and it's it's time to dry why don't you tell us a little bit about <laughs> okay what your medium is and what you're you're trying to achieve here okay well first i want to say so for about 28 years prior to stepping into oils i've only been experimenting and involved with the medium of oils for maybe 15 years at this point. Prior to that, my, my whole first part of my career, I did watercolors. Oh, oh, I, did, okay. I was a watercolorist for 20 something years. Mm, okay. And I had I had mastered it, I mean, I, and I love the medium. I, I, I love watercolors, I love uh, the techniques, and um, you know, I love the paper, the paint, I love everything about it. Uh, and w was doing quite well making sale, sales. And of course, watercolors are pretty easy because they dry in no time. So the turnover could be pretty high. A um, little tricky when you photograph them because, because of the, the light penetrates, a lot of the colors are, are not opaque, a lot of the colors absorb the light, so it's a little bit tricky. Okay. But when you, when you finish a watercolor and you wanna 
you, you know, you're asked to do a show, you're looking at, you have to pay for matting and framing, even if it's the most basic, and the pieces that I was doing were quite large. And then, you, you know, to get it recorded, you know, the money for the, the slides, again, to have them color, color accurate, at that point was quite extensive and very expensive, mm -hmm. all of it. And then by the time you would have your show, you've got quite an investment into watercolor, into producing watercolors, and the return wasn't necessarily as much. Right, I mean... It, because, because of its longevity. I mean, you know, some of the, some of the paints are not light fast. Oh. Some of the, my favorite colors, which are cobalts, have a tendency to fade in, in natural light. So there was always, you know, it's, it was, there was always something. So and it has it had a shelf life. Is that what I'm having? Well, some of the no. paintings. Well, some of the paintings did, but you stamp them like a, like. Well, a no, tuna because oftentimes you when that? you're when you're selling a piece, you're you're part of that sale. Right. And you know you have an opportunity to talk to to, to meet with your client or discuss with your client where the best place to install that piece is going to be. You know, because mm -hmm. especially with watercolors, you know, you don't want to put it in an area that that gets damp. Mm -hmm. You know. And uh, direct sunlight on some of those pieces was important for them to know, look, this can't get any direct sunlight or even indirect sunlight, but this is how you would light it up, you know, to show it off and display it. And you're, the piece is going gonna, is gonna to last, you know, throughout time. Mm -hmm. Or as much as we know, that was the other thing about watercolors. They don't know how long they will last, right? It's not like oils. Oils we have a history with. You know, the, the world has a history with oils. Okay. You know, the masters and oils. And, and that's part of why the, the oils you can get you know, so financially. The, ad, the advent of wa watercolor has occurred in, in later centuries is what you're saying. It, it, it did, it? yes. It right. has and it did. And even though products are, you know, pretty much off the hook right now when it comes to watercolors, you're still dealing with, if, if your watercolor paper is you know, what they would consider museum quality. Mm -hmm. It's 100% archival, 100% uh, rag, cotton, paper, and there's no, there's no additives in it. There's no, you know, binders. There's nothing in mm -hmm. it that's going to create it to yellow mm -hmm. or, you know, over time. Um, but still, it's, you're still dealing with paper, you know, which over time, depending on where it's located, you know, it could become fragile. We don't know. But, you know, for oils, there's linen, there's canvas, there's um, wood panels to paint on. Right. And the medium itself, I mean, you know, with oils, once you, you know, once you've completed a piece, the chances are, if you're using all the, all the materials properly, the, the chances are it's going to be around forever, you know. Even if it has, you know, a varnish on it, varnishes are, are made at this point that don't yellow through time or don't crack or don't disturb the painting. They're made to actually evaporate completely and leave a nice, beautiful finish, hmm. you know. But all the materials you use properly, you should get a piece that, you know, that you know is going to be around in hundreds and hundreds of years. So that's, for a person like me, that's attractive uh, because I do consider the work that I do museum quality. Not everything that I do is museum quality because there are different pieces that I do um, for other projects. And, uh, but in, in my own personal work and when I show in um, gallery, my work is always museum. And it's always done with you know, quality products, every, every bit of it. Well, why don't you take us through sort of um, the basics? So the, the, so the bigger canvases that I have right here, this, I have a large one back here. This one is actually custom. I, it's custom uh, framed. I have a guy in Santa Rosa, and I had done a series of paintings that were eight and a half foot by four foot with a two and a half, two and a half inch wrap, museum wrap on them. And those canvases, I had, I had them designed and built from a gentleman in um, Santa Rosa who kiln dries the woods. All the corners are put together in the back with metal brackets. So basically, again, the piece is going to last forever. But, um, and I started out with the large canvases. I like the idea of when I'm producing a painting, I like the idea of one to one. 
So the bigger ones were made for Explain horse. Explain that for the art. So one-to-one -one is not, not taking that image and reducing it. It's actually uh, producing the image exactly how it's seen in its, and replicating in its size. So the big, the big paintings were done, uh, were, the big canvases were for horses. I did a series of horses and um, I wanted the height and I wanted essentially the size depending on what the horse was doing. The, the large canvas was perfect for this particular uh, horse, Andalusian horse Spanish that does the leaping in the air. It's, it's like it's an incredible dance that these horses do and so I could, I could get on a, on a canvas that size I could get the entire leap and the entire horse in that leap and you know everything that was going on and so uh, and that the big canvas series that ended up being quite successful and then from from you know I've done horses off and on throughout my entire career I love them um, there's something magical about horses powerful mm -hmm. you know uh, I started playing a little bit about 15 years ago also with um, with the, the series of horses, I started playing with the background. I, I wanted the background to be dropped out. And with oils, I could literally get a flat background and then the horse itself and all of its glossy parts on its coat. I could use uh, different mediums and actually make it glossy permanently, mm. you know, color. And, and, and so that played a, a big part on trying to, the, the effect I was looking for was to get that horse to look like it was literally leaping off the canvas. So push the background back, bring the horse up into the forefront, depending on the light, if it's lit just right, mm. that horse looks 3D, it looks three-dimensional. And so I started playing with that and that was, um, it was fascinating for me that I could get that look on a flat surface. And um, I went from the horses to uh, going into engines. I love engines. I love structure. I love structural things. Mm. Um, and whether that's um, architecture, or whether it's engines, or whether it's uh, horses, it's all architectural. I think for me, if I could sum up who I am and what I like to produce, it would be um, things that I feel or, or uh, things of beauty. Um, either by nature or man-made. I like the journey. Horses provide that. Mm -hmm. Motorcycles provide that. Airplane, air travel provides that. Um, and actually the, the common thread right now is that a horse is a horse is a horse. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in the propeller on this particular piece, I reflected that by putting the Native Americans on horseback as they're receding into the background. Um, and as the, the airplane, even though it's vintage, as it was coming into more into the foreground. And telling that story about travel and time and environment and structure and uh, basically a journey. It's all a different type of a journey. It fascinates me. The, and there's a sense of freedom to all that too. I haven't heard that word come out. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's... I saw that I mean, <laughs> horses are running uh -huh. and moving and And if freedom. you know me, so, okay, so at me as a, that would, would be, that's a perfect <laughs> Do we Do we point. ring that bell there maybe well, a little bit or... Oh, and no? if you know me, that would be what I would say to anybody and everybody that does know me. Uh, We'll applaud you on bringing that up. Well, I'm just getting no, <laughs> It's almost no like you were reading here. my mind. <laughs> yeah, well, I was, uh, no, that was, the, you because were putting it through there, that's yeah, for sure. It's, it's <laughs> all, it is all, ultimately, oh, yeah. it's, that's a key component to me in my life. I've done a lot of traveling and freedom, I would say freedom is my biggest asset. Part of my fascination with your work is, is your ability for the detail, mm -hmm. your ability to capture I mean, uh, and, and I'm sure you did this when you were doing your watercolor. Mm -hmm. you're, you're working in abstractness, right? Mm -hmm. Levels of abstraction. Mm -hmm. It is. It, it can and, be very abstract. And, yeah. and, and, and even though this piece here on the floor has a little more 
movement, so movement and freedom mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. it. When you look at this particular mm -hmm. piece, I mean, it is about as detailed and specific written mm -hmm. as you could get. So where do you go in your mind, heart, soul? What happens? Because I can't even, I've been practicing making squares and circles. I figured, you know, right. can I do a circle? <laughs> I can't, I mean, you got lots of bolts and all this stuff. That right. You, so t talk right. a little bit about that whole specificity that you're working with and, and how you get there. Right. Um, well, first, first, oh, I, it's an interesting um, paradigm, I feel, for myself because one of the things that I've, that I've struggled with throughout my lifetime is my own, uh, I would say, emotional and physical foundation. Um, it's, it's, I'm going to put this out as, as, try to translate this as easily as I can. Mm -hmm. So art, my art for me is uh, stability. A lot of artists don't find necessarily find stability in their artwork. Mine is stability. This is very foundational. Some people might say it's very graphic, but actually for me it's very foundational. Um, my parents were killed when I was very young, eight. And that was, that's a very pivotal time for most children. They're learning how to trust their environment. That's all, that, that year is all about trust and trusting the people in your environment and your environment. And what probably got me through that the time of the loss of my parents and up through my you know my early adult years was building foundations through my artwork mm -hmm. it's solid it's taking something that's that's not tangible and making it tangible and making it solid the airplane is um, putting all those parts together is a way of of making something um, solid for me in my life, structurally solid. And it's interesting because it's a painting. It's not a life, but it is a life in that painting and it's my life. It's mm -hmm. how I've taken a life that's been a struggle and I, I can put it all nicely and neatly together and it all works. 